Thank you for coming in, Dawn. It's okay. Um, so Reads in Your Piece, we published it a year ago, June <laughs> last year. And what really shocked me was how, A, relevant it is a year on, mm. and also B, how prescient the opening lines are about prophecies not being listened to. Because, of course, horribly, that's what happens in the case of Grenfell Tower. Mm. And that's something you've been reporting on quite a lot recently. Yeah, I mean, it's, as you said, I went back to read it and I thought maybe I should make some changes before I start. And I couldn't think of a single change to make because nothing has changed and, and things have only gotten worse. And, you know, when it came to Grenfell Tower, the big tragedy was obviously, you know, a huge loss of life. But the fact that it was completely avoidable, that a lot of this was down to the housing crisis, but it was equally down to people not being listened to. So it wasn't just the fact that our entire housing system is limping along and really, really hurting the most vulnerable and isn't functioning for almost anybody, but also the fact that it speaks of a kind of wider rot across Britain. I think it's a big, I think we have a big issue here in the, in the, in the last 30 years. The state has been hollowed out both locally, nationally, and in terms of services. And I think Grenfell Tower was the kind of biggest, most tragic symbol of that. And they're still not being listened to. And no. there's still a hollowing out of who do you go to, who's accountable. And so today they've released the scope of the inquiry and it's only going to be limited to the causal mm. reasons for the fire and not to the wider issues of housing policy mm. do you think that's a that's the right move or the wrong thing to do i think it's the wrong move i think every resident i've spoken to has said right from the outset that they feel that they were victims not just of a you know maybe some decisions that were made with the building and renovation of the of the tower but actually the victims of wider society the victims of how we treat the poorest in society how we treat migrants how we treat anybody who can't afford to own their own home and who isn't in a high paying job and i think that they're right you can't just take this out of the context that it is in and also if we just look at one or two things about the structure of the tower about the, the way that certain things were carried out when it came to renovation we lose the opportunity to uh, find out exactly what it is that is wrong with Britain that caused this to happen we also mean I mean it also means that for other people you know it doesn't stop this from happening again it doesn't address how many other people are in similar situations that although it may not culminate in the same problem but it, it will continue to victimise people. I mean, all you have to do is look at, you know, South London this week, where you have the, you know, four tower blocks in Peckham that were, you know, even before Grenfell Tower happened, I spoke to residents who had cracks in the wall and were worried about the structure. They were worried about their safety. And now it turns out that all along they were in massive danger. So in 1968, when the Ronan Point Tower block collapsed, um, it meant that we changed building regulations in this country because essentially you had concrete blocks that were held together by a couple of big industrial screws. So when there was a small gas explosion, the entire tower collapsed. After that, tower blocks were supposed to have been renovated if they were built in the same way. And obviously at some point, either the council were told it had been renovated or somebody else claimed they did it and didn't do it because all along this these four tower blocks have had this unbelievably unsafe structure and it's been like that for you know 50 years and in all that time people were in danger and we have no idea how many other people are in the same position and also we need to, you know without the inquiry being bigger there isn't going to be any kind of change in the way that we listen to people there isn't going to be any accountability that means that if people if people as in grenfell spoke up to councillors to mps spoke up to the landlords we need to actually make sure we listen to them and we change things as a result and as we reflected on your piece it, it doesn't seem like the government or councils are listening to any warnings about housing mm. be it small scale we think there's a problem with our ceiling as another mm. issue you wrote about or actually there's much wider structural issues at play here people can't get on the housing ladder mm. you mentioned some other things as well as social housing in your piece like extortionate rents mm. people not being able to buy their first home has there been any development with those absolutely crisis not either? i mean the only thing the government have brought in is uh, a small bill about 
stopping re stopping revenge evictions, which is pretty toothless. It doesn't really do anything. And also, if you do get evicted by a landlord and you want to take them to court, legal aid isn't there anymore. So yeah. you find someone to do it pro bono or you just don't do it. And almost nothing has happened it, apart from you know these small little tinkering uh, around the edges decisions but nothing has changed people are still struggling to get on the housing ladder people are still paying huge rents i had two friends recently who were trying to move to london and i was just shocked at some of the tales they had where they said they'd turn up to view a flat it was really pokey it had mold on the walls and uh and there were 14 people viewing it and they were told that because there were so many they were going to put the rent up by another 50 quid i've spoken to lots and lots of people who you know were in their 20s have a kind of professional job and are at this point consider considering whether they should be bunking up with friends sharing a bedroom because they just can't afford it anymore and you know since the recession we've seen house prices rise and rise and rise what we haven't seen is our wages rise. Mm -hmm. And more and more people are employ employed precariously, so they're struggling to make ends meet month to month. And as long as rents are high, you can't afford to save for a house. And even if you could save for a house, the amount you're going to have to save is obscene. And that's really frustrating. I, so <laughs> uh, on a personal note, I took a friend a flat viewing for the first time in mm. London from Liverpool. That's and a culture shock. Yeah, <laughs> and I was like, look, I've got to break it to you. We're not in Kansas anymore, Toto. Like, this is going to be really awful. So this this brings me to to one of my big questions, which is, and it's something you brought up in your piece, mm. which is housing is profit over people. Yeah. So we've taken what essentially should be a necessity, just like a basic necessity for shelter, safe mm. and affordable shelter, has all of a sudden been turned into an instrument of finance. So for councils, mm. that's, I mean, not even for councils, because tax receipts go back to central government actually yeah. for social housing. <laughs> Don't even get that, do they? Um, landlords, mm. um, people buying houses, not because they want to buy a house, but they don't see any future for themselves exactly. with a state pension so they need to buy mm. it as a nest egg people buying in london because it's an investment mm -hmm. opportunity so my question is is housing so integral to the way that we plan the uk economy that the only way to solve the housing crisis is a shake-up Absolutely. I mean, one thing that worries me is, I mean, where I think it's the 10th year, 10th year anniversary of the uh, financial crash. And obviously, when Osborne was in charge of the UK economy, uh, before he became in charge of a newspaper, he, he he would point at green shoots in the economy and say, look, austerity has worked, we're back on track. And then when you actually drilled down into it and looked at what where the growth was coming from, you realise that the amount of GDP that rests on housing is utterly terrifying. And, you know, increasing numbers of people can't afford to buy homes. You have uh, increasing numbers of foreign investors ploughing money into it. All it takes is for us to finally reach a tipping point where almost nobody can buy and then the market collapses. And we're getting quite close to that now. You know, if you look around London and speak to estate agents, as I have the misfortune to do quite a bit for my job, they all say that the luxury market is tailing off. So... Where I live in Clapham, I live on the top of a small low-rise council block. And from my balcony, you can see the Thames. And at the moment, it's just a tangle of cranes. Lots and lots and lots of luxury flats popping up. And I walked home from Victoria to Clapham the other night. And it was just fascinating how you could see the financialization of the housing market just by walking down the street. So I walked past a lot of, um, you know, Victorian uh, built council homes that were all you know, nice red brick blocks, very, very desirable. Lots, you know, there's still some council tenants living in there, lots of people trying to get them to be right to buy. And they were all full, there were lots of lights on. It was Saturday evening, but lots of people were home with their families or you know, in couples, etc. And then when you got to the river, you saw all of these big skyscrapers. There's a very, very tall one called St. George's uh, Tower at St. George's Wharf. And it's, you know, got Guardian investigation revealed last year that it was almost entirely foreign owned and nobody lives in it. People have bought it. They've treated it like a asset locker. And it's a safer investment than stocks and shares. So they've just bought it up. So I walked past it, looked up, counted about five lights on. 
carried on walking um, past Vauxhall Station and saw four very, very large blocks of luxury flats. No lights, you know, no lights in them whatsoever. Managed to find one or two lights in some of the blocks, but a lot of them were completely empty. And when I, you know, and I thought maybe they haven't been sold yet, looked them up online, all sold, all completely, you know, bought up, but empty. And then walk a few minutes away and you reach another council estate, all the lights are on. And at the same time in Lambeth, you have a huge council waiting list of people desperate to get into housing. And nobody is building houses for low-income people. Nobody is building houses for you know young couples who are on middling incomes and want to get want to have children, want to get on the property ladder. Instead, what they're doing is building houses that make a huge amount of profit. And often when you go into them, you realise they aren't even built to be lived in. Not the, at all. There's an estate yeah. close to me and a really telling fact about this new estate that's been built is that there's a, a meeting room that you can hire <laughs> out. Families don't hire out meeting no. rooms. Real people don't hire out meeting rooms. People who were dropping off into the city <laughs> and dropping out for financial business deals need meeting rooms where they live. And it's and this and this is the problem with the Conservatives and you know, pretty much Labour before them saying that all we need to do is leave housing to the market. You do actually need to break in and interfere with the market because it, you know the, the house, housing is very different in terms of economic goods in that it is what people people need it. Uh, and unfortunately, we have so, lots and lots of people who can't access it. So you have people on the streets who are homeless. You have people who are in temporary accommodation and the, you know, the cost of temporary accommodation for council is sky high. So expensive. It's, you know, you, I mean, I spoke to one family who are living in a one, you know, there were five of them, they're living in one bed and the council were paying about £800 to a private landlord for this a week. And if we built a council home and they lived in it, the housing benefit they paid would go back to the council. But, and I think this is why, I think one of the biggest indicators that, our attitude towards housing has become so perverse is just after the Grenfell Tower fire when everybody was discussing how to house residents, how to house so many people who've been, you know, kicked out of their home because it caught fire. And, you know, Jeremy Corbyn came out and said that we should consider requisitioning homes mm -hmm. because, as everybody pointed out, there were, I think, 1,650 empty homes in, in, in Kensington and Chelsea. And instantly the backlash was obscene. I mean, the number of people I saw, you know, relatively wealthy homeowners came out and said, you can't do this. People's property rights pr trump everything else. And if you look at the you know, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, humans have a right to shelter. Yeah. But people cared more about people's right to own a property and leave it empty at a time of a severe housing crisis that sees people on the street, that sees people with no home. And it seemed that a lot of people, you know, who were very vocal had come out and said that property rights trumped your right to shelter. Luckily, when YouGov asked, you know, a wider panel of people, a kind of representative panel, turned out 68% of people agreed that empty homes should be requisitioned and, you, you know, and agreed with Jeremy Corbyn rather than agreed with the property fetishists. There is a public appetite. I mean, the response to the Labour manifesto, especially the housing part of it with, you know, more social housing mm. rent cap yeah not control it was a cap yeah um people people want it i was actually really surprised by how mm. many people were up for requisition and empty properties it's um, it, it surprised me but it is yeah i mean it I, I find it really fascinating how it was a it was a really common trope amongst the election where jeremy corbyn would come out and say something and the conservatives were act shocked you know a big chunk of the media would act shocked as if he'd have proposed making Britain a communist state, and what? That's not what happened, you know. Or no? No, well, I mean, it will be, but <laughs> but every single time, you know, the Conservatives will say, "Oh, he's off his trolley. He's, you know, this wild communist." And then Hugo would come back, and people would agree with him. And I just think we've become completely 
brainwashed through kind of decades of centrism into believing that um, the British public won't entertain left-wing ideas. They will only entertain very tame kind of third-way triangulated ideas when actually there's a big appetite for change. And that comes from, you know, people being completely sick of social injustice, people being upset about the fact that food banks exist, people being upset that homelessness has doubled in seven years, and people being upset about seeing people being burnt out of their homes. So actually, I disagree with that point. Mm. I think, I don't actually think that it's to do with Um, people perceiving other people's situations. Mm. I think it's a lot to do, especially with housing, about people feeling it themselves. Yeah. People thinking, I worry that I can't keep up with my mortgage repayments or I, you know, I'm a well-to-do in my 20s, got a good degree, but still can't ever imagine Mm. owning my own house. I give away a third of my income to rent each month. I feel like housing... No, people I, are really starting yeah. to feel it. But no, I completely agree. And I think that that, I think ha- I think housing is actually one of the big reasons why Labour did so well. And it's not just because of the housing policies they put forward. I think they were quite tame. They could have, they, they, they could have been more adventurous with housing than I think they should have been. I think it comes from the fact that when you look at the age of people who voted Labour, obviously, you know, it's a very, very stark difference. The younger you are, the more likely you are to vote for them. But I think that the Tories expected a lot of people in their 40s and kind of early 50s to vote for them. But actually, a lot of people in their 30s and 40s have been hit really, really badly by the crisis themselves personally. Mm-hmm. But also a lot of people in their 40s are you know, thinking about their children and thinking, where will my children live uh, if we can barely afford mortgage repayments how on earth are they going to afford it uh and also people who have children in university university is you know i I don't understand how students get through now given how expensive you know uh, costs are when i was at university i had to have a job on top of my studying and then every christmas every easter holiday every summer i had to work full time just to just to make ends meet and you know, I 29, so it's like started uni about 10 years ago. And now when I look at how much the student loans increase, which is barely by barely any amount of money at all, and housing has almost tripled in costs. The cost of food has gone up, cost of fuel and transport has gone up. Everything has gone up so much. Student loans haven't. And all we're doing is, is meaning is, is sending our kids off to, you know, to pay £9,000 a year for university, struggle to pay their rent. And, you know, I speak to so many students now who contact me about housing and say that they're going to drop out because they can't afford it. So, you know, you start life saddled with debt. You're never going to afford a house. And your student overdraft goes entirely on your rent. And when I speak to students now, it has changed them. They drink a lot less, they go out a lot less, and they have a, a, lot, a lot less fun. And you look at people in their 20s, and they aren't going out anywhere near as much as, you know, my friends in their 40s that they did when they were in the, in the 90s. And then you look at people in their 30s who want to have kids and are still in shared accommodation. And I think it's completely changing the pattern of British society. And I think it's going to be a really, really, lo- you know, a really, really long lasting problem if lots of people don't have kids or have kids a lot later, if lots of people drop out of university. And I think often with politics, we assume it's going to be a short, you know, we were constantly told austerity was short term belt tightening, but we don't take into consideration just how much like five years of a policy will change people's life and have a huge impact on them in the long term. And it is a long term problem. I always think about when people use the term housing crisis mm. and I think it's not a crisis. It's a, it's a permanent state of being for the UK. It's right a permanent now. dysfunction at the yeah. moment because the only thing that will change it is an intervention. And the reason why nobody wants to intervene is because The only way to do that is for some people who own homes and have made a big profit on those homes to take a hit. So house prices will have to come down. And that means that, you know, some people will end up in negative equity. Some people who, you know, are expecting a huge windfall if they sell their home suddenly won't have it. So there isn't a way that I can see to keep the people who have made some money, you know, on the housing, you know, on the permanent housing dysfunction we'll call it not the housing crisis i don't think there's a way of doing that without some people at the top taking the hit and most politicians don't want to do that because homeowners vote and 
I think the only thing that could change that is the fact that we've seen more young people coming out, young people are getting more upset and it's reaching you know, further into society. I think there'll come a point when absolutely everybody is affected by the housing crisis very, very adversely. And at that point, maybe, you know, it'll be very late by that point, but at that point, maybe we will have a crash or the government will have to intervene and do something to you know, regulate prices. If you had the opportunity to bring in three policies, mm -hmm. What would your top three be to solve the permanent housing dysfunction? Because it's not a crisis. Build council housing. Build a lot of council housing, both to house people in the immediate, uh, in, in, in you know, in the short term, immediately, and also to give people the opportunity, if they wanted to, to rent directly from the council. When I speak to a lot of people um, who, you know, who rent, and I say, if money were no object, would you rent or would you buy? And they all say buy. And then you say, okay, if money were no object and, and there was huge availability of everything, would you buy, rent privately, or rent a, council, a, a home from the council? And then it kind of splits quite evenly between buy in your home and rent from the council because you realise what everybody actually wants is security and they're not too worried about actually owning a property and having to deal with the boiler themselves. That's actually quite stressful. So, well. yeah. So my second one would be to make homelessness illegal. So if somebody comes to the council and says, I am homeless, the council have a duty to house them. They cannot turn anybody away. Um, if you live on the street and you go to the council, you should be given a home. Everybody should have a right to a home. Everybody should be given a home if they're homeless. So make homelessness illegal, because I think that's the only way you'll actually get councils and the government to take it seriously. Uh, and thirdly, I think I would ban second home ownership. And obviously people come out and say, yes, but, you know, some people need a second home. And, you know, what about my one friend who commutes from Liverpool to London, etc.? I think if you're living in them, it's fine. But I don't think there's any need for someone just to have another house for the sheer love of having one. And I think if we are in a crisis in the short term, why should some people have two houses while other people sleep on the street and have none? Well, thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thanks for having me.